respond to the kind of language that we use every day, that learn and reason for themselves, and also there's a lot of interest in robots that can see and can interpret what they see. So, where is our future research in this area going to come from? In Britain, the first Alvi research programme is currently being wound up, and only this week, European ministers failed to agree on any more funding for fifth generation research and development as the British were dragging their heels. But there is one institute here that was set up a few years ago. It's named after Alan Turing and it pays for its own research by selling its expertise worldwide. Fred now reports from north of the border. Taking in the real world is something that we as humans take very much for granted. But to a computer, Many of the things that we would call common sense are still major challenges. The intelligent computer is still very much in its infancy. And research into artificial intelligence can seem to be bogged down with solving the fundamentals. Even a machine that can play reasonable chess might seem fine as an academic plaything, but not a lot of use on the factory floor. The Turing Institute in Glasgow has an international reputation as a leading centre for artificial intelligence research. But they also explore practical applications of AI for use in the real world, even though some of those applications are a long way off. Peter Murphy's robotics project combines many technologies which are part of artificial intelligence work, including vision systems and software which learns by experience. It's using three mechanical devices uh, that are not linked by wires. The only way that they are being linked in terms of their functionality uh, is through uh, a mediocre of intelligence connected through sensory systems, vision, proximity and touch. Imagine this first robot is involved in some kind of circuit fault finding. When it's found a defective component, it takes the part across and places it in the vision area for both robots. It's effectively saying, give me one of these, using vision to pass across what it wants to the second robot. This second robot acts like a storeman turning to its conveyor belt to select a part. A proximity detector senses a component. The arm locates its exact position and then moves it to the area covered by the vision system. Then the software checks whether this part matches the dud component. We give the vision system many examples of one of these types of components and many examples of one of these types of components. And driven directly from the data, uh, uh, the planning system will generate rules that can then distinguish between these two separate components. It makes up its own rules. It makes up its own rules, yes, directly from the data. There is no, interve in, no intervention by a programmer for this task. This time the components don't match, so the Stormman robot returns the part to the conveyor. Once again, by a direct jab, it repowers the belt, picks up a second part, and takes it to the vision area. This time, with a pause to check the correct match, success. The spare part is moved carefully across to a transfer area for the other robot to collect. Now, you've got two robots there working side by side in a very uh, contained space. How do you make sure they don't bump into each other? Well, that's a very major concern when you start trying to get robots to carry out cooperative tasks. And the simple uh, point about bringing robots into close proximity is that you have to do it very cautiously and you'll note from the vision system that it always has a quick double look into the area of possible interaction before it very cautiously moves its way into those areas. Finally the failed component is thrown away. Well I can't help thinking it, it looks like a rather expensive toy. Do people take it seriously? Well, certainly it has been uh, taken seriously in that we received industrial funding to uh, uh, carry on with this research. But probably more importantly, the reason for receiving that industrial funding was that the company involved has witnessed a number of situations where conventional robotics has run into severe difficulties. And unfortunately, the idea of uh, precise, uh, high-precision robots working in an imprecise, in unpredictable world 
is doomed to disaster. Whilst research of this sort is vital for AI's future, the Institute needs something more immediately commercial to fund its operation. So, for the moment, most of the work being done at Turing is funded by industry and involves training people sent here from companies all over the world. This training is mainly in the use of so-called expert systems packages, software which can hold the knowledge of an expert as a set of rules and then apply those rules when the expert is no longer there. Professor Donald Mickey is the founder of the Turing Institute. Is AI still just an academic exercise? Not in the slightest. It's already becoming very rapidly an enormously lucrative business in a whole number of countries. Uh, we know that because our subscribing affiliate companies that belong to the Turing Institute Club uh, are scattered in different parts of the world and an increasing number of them are reporting corporate savings that are running into millions of dollars a year and in some cases tens of millions of dollars a year from little bits of software or advice or R&D that we've been able to uh, supply them. One of Turing's most successful commercial ventures was in the United States, working for a factory making nuclear fuels where targets just weren't being met. They used data about the many physical and chemical processes in the plant, which are involved in the making of uranium fuel pellets. Turing's software actually worked out the rules which governed the plant's efficiency. After many years of experience and improvement, we got the process yield to be about 80% on a consistent basis. That was good, but we thought perhaps we could do better. And then working with Donald Mickey, and eventually with the Turing Institute, and using the good advice and vision of Dr. Mickey, we decided to try machine learning, which is to say to let the machines operate themselves. We took a lot of data from the plant, and we have, in fact, so much data in such a plant with process control computers, strip charts, logs of various sorts. It's not a matter of not having enough information, it's a matter of having too much to figure out what to do better. By using the techniques recommended by Dr. Mickey, we found that we can operate the same plant with no change in capital equipment, not at 80%, but in the high 90s. The value to Westinghouse is millions of dollars. How much interest are you getting from the UK? Rather sluggish. Uh, there is one major oil company who are doing extraordinary work and they are perhaps in the lead in terms of uh, exciting and very cleverly conducted exploitation of this technology. I think that's the only example for the United Kingdom that uh, comes to mind and we are a self-funding body virtually entirely. Um, I would say that uh, only a minority of our funds comes from R&D contracts or from affiliate subscriptions from British companies. Most of it comes from the United States and continent of Europe. So is Britain missing the boat? I think that uh, we are, uh, not for lack of uh, capability, which uh, continues very high in spite of the brain drain and so forth. It's something to do with lack of attack. Well, that seems to be a complaint common to many British research centres. But things are very different in the US, where large corporations...